Shock is a medical emergency which can result in organ damage and death. During shock, a complex physiological response is triggered by decreased tissue perfusion. Tissue perfusion is the process of blood flowing through the body, providing oxygen and nutrients, and removing cellular waste. Ineffective tissue perfusion can result in tissue death due to hypoxia and cellular injury. There are four types of shock depending on underlying cause, hypovolemic, cardiogenic, obstructive, and distributive, which encompasses anaphylactic, septic, and neurogenic shock. The four stages of shock are initial, compensatory, progressive, and refractory. Early intervention is important to prevent progression to more severe stages. The initial stage, also called the early, non-progressive, or pre-shock stage, may be difficult to recognize due to subtle or absent symptoms. Something has led to a decrease in tissue perfusion. Cardiac output is low enough that cells begin to experience hypoxia. If tissues receive insufficient oxygen and nutrients, they switch from aerobic metabolism, which uses oxygen, to anaerobic metabolism, which does not use oxygen. Unfortunately, a byproduct of anaerobic metabolism is lactic acid. Normally, the liver deals with lactic acid, converting it to pyruvic acid and then to glucose via gluconeogenesis. But during shock, the liver is not working optimally. So lactic acid builds up in the bloodstream, dropping blood pH and causing acidosis, which causes even more damage to cells. Receptors in the carotid sinus and aortic arch sense a drop in blood pressure and stimulate the sympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system releases catecholamines epinephrine and norepinephrine. These catecholamines cause vasoconstriction, increased blood pressure, and increased heart rate. Less blood goes to the non-vital organs, such as the skin and gastrointestinal tract, while more blood is routed to vital ones like the heart and brain. Note that the drop in blood pressure results in decreased capillary hydrostatic pressure, the pressure blood puts on capillary walls. This triggers an increase in venous blood by shifting fluid from the interstitial compartment to the intravascular compartment. Baroreceptors also stimulate the vagus nerve, which stimulates the release of antidiuretic hormone from the posterior pituitary gland, preventing water from leaving the kidneys and thus increasing blood volume. The renin-angiotensin system also kicks into gear. This is a hormone system that regulates fluid and electrolyte balance, blood pressure, and vascular resistance. Vascular resistance is the resistance that must be overcome for blood to be pushed through the circulatory system and create flow. Vasoconstriction increases vascular resistance, while vasodilation decreases it. A reduction in blood flow to the kidneys triggers them to convert prorenin, found in blood, to renin. Renin is released into circulation, where it converts angiotensinogen, released by the liver, to angiotensin 1. With the help of angiotensin converting enzyme, angiotensin 1 gets converted to angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 2 is a superpowered vasoconstrictive peptide, which narrows both arteries and veins. Artery constriction increases blood pressure, while vein constriction allows more blood to return to the heart. Angiotensin II also triggers the release of aldosterone from the adrenal cortex. Aldosterone makes the kidneys retain more sodium and water and increase excretion of potassium. This means more retention of water in the bloodstream and increased blood pressure. Compensatory mechanisms increase cardiac output and blood volume, which is critical to supply vital organs. However, some compromises are being made. Perfusion is decreased to the GI tract, so it slows down. There is a risk for paralytic ileus, paralysis of the intestines. There is also decreased perfusion to the skin, which makes it cold and clammy. The one exception to this is if the person is in septic shock. In this case, there is vasodilation in the skin, and it will be hot and flushed. Decreased perfusion results in parts of the lungs not getting perfusion, which means that gas exchange does not occur in these parts. This means there is a mismatch between ventilation and perfusion and blood oxygen levels decrease. To compensate, the person hyperventilates, increasing the rate and depth of their breathing. It is important to remember that the body can only maintain rescue efforts in the form of compensatory mechanisms for a limited duration. During the progressive stage, compensatory mechanisms have failed. They are no longer able to maintain adequate tissue perfusion, which leads to worsening tissue damage. The body is now progressing towards multiple organ dysfunction syndrome. 
No more compensation means low cardiac output and low tissue perfusion. Cells do not receive oxygen, succumbing to cell hypoxic injury. Cells begin to swell as ion pumps fail. Capillary permeability increases, and this is key to the pathology of this stage. The barrier between intravascular and interstitial space is broken down. Fluid and protein are drawn into the interstitial space, and this results in major edema. This also depletes blood volume, the very thing the body fought to increase in the previous stage. This in turn decreases cardiac output and tissue perfusion. But what happens in various organs? When the brain does not receive adequate perfusion, there is a major mental status change. The person's speech is very slow and they will be agitated. They will not respond to stimulation. Heart cells begin to die, including those of the electrical conduction system, which tells the heart to pump blood. This results in cardiac dysrhythmias. In the lungs, acute respiratory distress syndrome develops. Increased capillary permeability in alveolar sacs, the site of gas exchange, results in their collapse, and the lungs lose elasticity. This results in fluid in the lungs, lower oxygen levels, high respiratory rate, and respiratory failure. The person requires intubation and mechanical ventilation in order to keep breathing. In the GI tract, cells also begin to die. Ulcers form as the cells that protect the gut's lining from its own acid stop working. This results in massive gastrointestinal bleeding. Because the liver's cells are also dying, and the liver produces most clotting factors, clotting doesn't work well. There is also disseminated intravascular coagulation. Small clots form in vessels, further blocking blood flow to organs. These clots deplete the body's platelets and clotting factors, resulting in massive and uncontrolled bleeding. Blood oozes out of IV sites or punctures. The fourth and final stage of shock is the refractory stage. It is characterized by poor tissue perfusion, hypotension, and organ failure. Despite aggressive resuscitation efforts, the person is unlikely to survive. As a final note, the most common cause of shock in children is hypovolemic shock, while the most common cause in adults is septic shock.